Welcome to our training today on digital signatures and scanning. Thank you guys all for attending. Uh, this is Sartre Rowe. I'm working with Northwest Justice Project on LSNTAP here. And this is part of a series of different trainings to help people uh, work remotely. Um, we've got some other experts who are on the line here also. Um, I've got William Guyton here helping out and doing color commentary um, today. And we also have Nia Pat from the Northwest Justice Project. I'm um, talking about one of the technologies in particular. Uh, but the first thing we want to do is kind of get a little bit of sense of what individuals um, are using for technology. We're doing two different things here. We're doing scans and we are doing digital signatures and we're gonna be starting with the scanning side of it. Um, try using that question box and tell us what you use or how you are scanning things currently. Um, feel free to drop in there that you um, are not scanning also. Uh, but we want to kind of get an idea of the different um, scanning apps that individuals are using today. So we've got uh, one person with Genius Scan so far, um, Scanner or Office Lens. Office Lens is definitely one of the more popular ones in the community. You use your computer um, to email yourself a PDF. That is, that's a very common, a great tip that definitely isn't in the presentation yet. Um, currently scanning using PDF to email. There's a lot of that. Um, we've got uh, someone here using iPhone. Um, and I'm curious um, what app they're using, if they're just using the camera on there or other things. Um, HP all-in-one scan. Um, several of the different printer companies have some nice um, scanning software also. Another genius scan. Um, a lot of people use in their phones, um, iPhone and um, Android here. Um, and then the convert to PDF. We've got not scanning and they're here to kind of learn about that. And you're definitely at the right place at this point. In scanning, uh, we did kind of a survey of the community, asked for some tips, and also did some external research here of things to consider um, for scanning. Microsoft Lens was definitely the most popular um, scanning tool that we ran into. Uh, the big thing about uh, Microsoft Office Lens um, is the ability for it to easily integrate with OneNote, OneDrive, and other Office um, items. The scanning on it is very easy. In the handout section, um, we actually had one of the legal services organizations from Washington State here um, put together a tutorial. And in your control panel, that tutorial is uh, covers Office Lens step by step. Edith, Office Lens was definitely uh, the most popular that came up and that guide is extremely useful. Um, it's also free to use, reputable, protects your privacy um, within it directly. One of the other more popular um, is Google scanning, but um, it's not um, the equivalent, which is Google Lens. Um, Google Lens does have some scanning options, um, but it's actually set up as a much more um, visual program that is designed to recognize locations or other things. Um, it's actually um, Google Drive and Google Drive on it has a very simple, easy to use scanning feature. Um, in the bottom right of it, it has a plus. You open up the camera and then there's the ability to scan directly. You crop um, and then you can add it and you can send it directly to um, Google Docs. The integration is very easy. Um, it is extremely easy to use overall. Um, and especially for individuals that are using um, Google Drive in some way or other products, that integration um, is very easy. Um, one of the next uh, ones that we had several suggestions on, um, although much less than those last two, um, was a standalone application called ScanBot. The Android version is currently about $10 or I believe it was 15 for two. Um, it is a application that just scans. Um, the free version of it is very, very, very low featured. Um, the full version um, has the ability to send it to um, FTPs. It has built-in automation. Um, it has compression built in. It 
does work with things like Box and Google Drive. This was one of the more um, full-featured kind of medium price scanning apps uh, that has a really good reputation. Uh, the biggest issue though is definitely uh, the cost on it. Um, the Android cost um, has even been kind of a monthly subscription or a or more, ex sorry, not Android, the iPhone cost. They are um, strongly dedicated um, to your privacy, protecting your privacy. They've got a very simple a policy that they do not um, look at any of your stuff. And that's one of the things to really look at um, when you're checking out free apps. Um, Google and Microsoft have very reasonable policies there. Scambot um, has privacy first. A lot of the other um, free apps that are out there um, may take geolocation information, they may be advertising, they may or may not data share, or they may even have an incomplete privacy policy. So making sure that the policy that's there is gonna protect you and protect your client's data is very important. Also make sure that whatever permissions that those applications are looking for or reasonable. Uh, several of the free applications to do very basic things like email someone the scan um, or share it will ask you for a three or five or $10 upgrade. And by the time you do several upgrades uh, to get the basic features you need, it's no longer anywhere near a free application um, and you may be leaking more data or more information. Definitely, if there's another application that you're using for scanning, check out the terms of service on it and make sure that it has the basic features from the beginning that you need. William, what are you guys using for scanning? Um, we're, we're using all the above. Um, part of what we did when we, when we started moving Lasso to 365 Azure was we, we made sure that when we did our printer leasing across the program that the printers we were going to lease for the next five years had the ability to scan to SharePoint. So that's primarily back when we used to work if, work in a physical office pre-pandemic, you'd, you'd walk up to an HP 527 and actually scan to an underscore scans folder that we set up within your private OneDrive in, in 365. Uh, but you know we've have we we've, we've deployed some scan snaps across the program when we needed high speed scanning uh and obviously we 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 use a lot of uh adobe, uh, adobe lens um i've been doing a, uh, adobe sign all morning <laughs> so it's it's microsoft microsoft lens but we've we've been promoting uh microsoft lens uh, uh in a big way cuz it's another way to get your to get those particular scans into your uh onedrive environment Mm -hmm. That's especially important when you're out in clinics because you like mm -hmm. to to take as little equipment as possible setting up and tearing down clinics. So the smartphone app is really helpful at the clinic level. Yep, definitely. Uh, Molly does make a point that the uh, the one paid app that was on here um, is is rather expensive. There are um, medium tier um, paid apps that are less um, expensive. Um, all of the other apps on here, we did focus on stuff that was definitely um, free. So outside of apps here, um, we also have a few suggestions that came in um, that were on the hardware side of things. Um, the Epson Workforce um, SE50 um, is a very portable um, individual scanner. Uh, it's very light. It hits five and a half pages uh, per minute um, and is one of the smaller kind of um, hardware solutions uh, that we've seen. Um, on the home office side, um, we've got an example here by Brother um, ADS 1200. Um, it is on the more expensive side at the 200. Um, it does hit a significant number of pages at 25 pages um, per minute here. Um, this is definitely on the uh, more expensive side. On the less expensive um, side, uh, Canon makes some nice stuff and the Canon Scan LIDE 300 Slim. Um, is one of the less expensive for a piece of hardware if you're doing a significant amount of scanning. Um, hopefully, you're not having to scan too much um, at home, but we have several jurisdictions um, out here in Washington um, that still do everything by paper, and people are still sending around large stacks of paper. Going to be moving on to section two here, um, which is going to take a little bit more time. It's digital signatures, cut and paste with Microsoft Word, and then convert 
Um, so a, a lot of kind of tech hack arounds um, to make something create a signature um, that is digital. Uh, and we've got a question on like, what is the, um, how do courts respond to those kind of hacks? And it, it widely varies um, on different courts. Just here in Washington state, um, we've got courts that are 100% fine with that. And then other courts that um, have major um, objections to just kind of that hack workaround of putting it into Word and printing. Um, some of them have actually required um, a separate affidavit stating that this is a that this signature is valid, uh, signed by the attorney or a potential witness. Bar sign and sign requests. Someone is asking about. Um, I am not familiar with R sign. Um, we will talk specifically about sign requests coming up. Okay, um, jumping into the um, digital signature here. And the first thing that we're looking at is just kind of the standards of things to look at or consider with digital signatures. And this is kind of across the board for any um, apps that you're using. Um, first one is authenticity and um, audit trail. Is there a way to prove what it is? Second thing is, um, does it work with kind of the eSign Act here in the US? Third is how mobile friendly is the way to do it. Uh, fourth is what are the different um, standards if you're starting to look at um, a product that specializes here. Um, does it have a document assembly option? Like how do you actually get it into the document that you need? And the last one, which we alluded to a little bit earlier is um, what are the local rules and what does your state or county court need or require? And it doesn't matter how good the particular product is, um, if the local rules don't align, uh, then that's where a lot of the challenge comes. A lot of states have been passing emergency rules. So for example, Oregon just passed an emergency rule through their Supreme Court that allows signatures and it requires an authentication um, process so that the user confirms that they were the signer, uh, but it doesn't prescribe a particular technology. So the answer to this um, could be a very low tech solution, as long as you've got documentation that that taking your signature, their signature and pasting it in the document um, is confirmed by them in some way. Uh, so having that authentication process, which could be a call or an email back from them, or a piece of information that they put in to the document that verifies that it was them could let a very low tech solution work. Um, so audit and authentication. Um, the tool that you're seeing here in the background is DocuSign. Um, DocuSign does several things to give you kind of an audit trail to show you that the signature is authentic. Um, they capture the IP address that something came from so that you can see it was an outside and its geolocation. Um, it creates a hash uh, back and forth. It, logs the time um, and date that something was signed. Uh, so it creates several trails here and also uses um, encryption um, to verify when that digital signature takes place. I'm gonna turn it over to Ornia um, from Northwest Justice Project to talk a little bit about DocuSign while we're in this, not just related to authentication, um, but she's one of the individuals who uses it most over at Northwest Justice Project. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so there's a really good question here um, from Monica. Is it safe um, to share your IP addresses on documents? Um, it is uh, geolocation information and can often be um, traced back to a general place. Um, it is something I would consider personally identifiable um, information, especially when combined with other pieces of information. Um, so it may not be safe uh, to share that. Uh, the screenshot here is of the audit screen, which often comes directly after um, the document, and it gives you a bunch of information that you can use later to verify that. One of the best practices that I've seen so far in the community is to keep that um, audit information separate in their case file and only bring it forward when it is actually needed um, by the court if authenticity is questioned 
and to possibly even seal that if there's a reason to keep some of this information um, out of the public's uh, hands or even possibly uh, opposing party um, if you need to do some type of uh, in-camera review. Um, but yes, this information can be used to find private things out about somebody, which is why I don't recommend blindly filing it with the court. So anyways, my name is Naya, actually, and um, our office at NJP started using DocuSign probably a year and a half ago, maybe, mm -hmm. and it was given to a short few people within offices to see if we liked the program. Right away, I figured out that it's extremely simple program to use. It's like three or four maybe clicks to get documents, as long as your clients have email. Um, you can get them to sign. If they don't have an email account, then that's obviously kind of a big deal because you have to send the signature request through email. And if you're sending to a significant other and they're trying to use their spouse's email address, that doesn't typically work very well either because it assigns the address and the name to the person's account. What we've seen with the courts is that they um, are accepting it, at least in Spokane County. I've used it in Spokane County, Lincoln County, um, Ponderay County, Stevens County, and I think a whole bunch of the other offices are able to use it as well. The one thing that they do require, though, is some version of an electronic signature, signature declaration from the person who received it. There's an audience question That's definitely here. One, of the, one of the more common things that some of the pre-existing local rules would require is um, that declaration add-on. Yeah, and they used to have, well, the rule is a GR-17 of some sort, um, and we've modified it to say an electronic signature declaration, and we say very specifically that we sent it to our client and that they sent it back to us via DocuSign. That way, it doesn't have all of this authentication audit in the background of the record, but if the court were ever to want it, we would have access to it to provide to them so we don't file it with the court file. Um, so do you use the um, templating option within Document Sign at all? Um, I recently started using it, um, mm -hmm. but most often we do declarations from clients, so those are unique in and of themselves. The way that you can use the templates are for maybe retainer agreements. We have a citizenship form that would be really helpful in that way. Um, I found that having a few of those is useful, but because we modify each document individually for the client, I usually just upload a Word document which uploads as a PDF, and then I get the best outcome that way and you can see the signature the best. I have found through DocuSign that sometimes if you are uploading a already scanned PDF, sometimes the signatures and the boxes become very little and you can't get the signature out itself. And so it's a glitch with the program. It's happened to me maybe a handful of times. Um, so it's really not a big issue, but it works best with just Word documents or in the template form if you set up your templates properly. Excellent. Um, so we've got a few questions here. Um, first, uh, would you be willing to share that um, declaration, um, the GR17 one that you've customized? Um, yeah, I'm absolutely willing to do that. I have to redact it, but I can I can certainly show you right. the sample. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and I'm happy to post that with the materials and um, put it and send it out to the email um, list of individuals who attended this. So it's okay. available. Um, second one is um, what type of, what are the basic elements of that? Um, of what specifically, sorry? Of that declaration. Like what, what does it basically say? Um, let me grab one out and I can see. I just okay. did one not too long ago. Let me see. Because I, I remember in Washington State, the like model language talks about like facsimiles and stuff. That this is actually a very old rule. Um, that it yeah. sounds like you've got an innovative um, way of repurposing it to show that you're using digital signatures. Right. So typically, our heading is declaration regarding signature on electronic document. Mm -hmm. Um, we put that I Naya declared a penalty of perjury. 
that the foregoing electronic document attached to this declaration consists of however many pages it does. It's a complete and legible image. I examined it and I received it by email on the date. And then I always put said document is signed by the person via DocuSign. And then mm -hmm. I sign that. Yep. Um, uh, any other um, things that may have been surprising to you in setting this up or um, tips that would be helpful to people that may be setting it up for the first time? Yeah, so a couple of things that I learned later on because I kind of fudged my way through the program at first was one of the main things that you can do is you can set reminders within the program to send it uh, reminders like to the client, say I want a declaration signed and it's not super important to get it done that moment. So I, there are places within the program where you can set reminders to resend it like maybe every day or two um, so that the client automatically gets a reminder and it keeps popping up in their email until they send it to me. Uh -huh. um, one of the other things is that if there's someone else in my office that needs it um, and they want and I'm maybe leaving for the day, but they still need to get it back from the client when it's signed. There mm -hmm. are people that instead of just signing, there are people that can receive a copy of it once it's signed and then it would go to their email as well. So then I, I always get the signed copy, but then I can send it to anybody else who needs to receive the copy and then I don't have to monitor it as well. Um, so I found that that is extremely helpful. And then, Um, I guess I haven't used the templates as much. I'm learning them, but it looks like they're extremely helpful and you could set them up for certain people. So if I had, um, like I service three different attorneys, so I could set up template envelopes that have all of the required documents per attorney, and then it would build those templates for me depending on who I want to use or who I need to sign. And then I could have the client sign and the attorney sign all at the same time. And it's, it's fairly simple there. You can have multiple people sign. You can put mm -hmm. the, um, the, you can put who you want to sign first and then it goes to so-and-so to sign and then it goes to so-and-so to sign. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of different things that you can do within that program. Mm -hmm. I see how that order of signatures could be very useful. Um, especially if you have parties that may have some trust issues or other things, to see that it's been assigned by other people already um, can alleviate some of those tensions. Yes. And um, I've also started using it with, because we're all working from home, I've started doing it on some court orders with opposing counsel. So then uh -huh. the opposing counsel is even recognizing it and signing it and sending it back to me instead of having to try to figure out how to fax it to them. So uh -huh. it's been working out pretty well. That's excellent. If um, if it comes out, out of this unfortunate situation that uh, we use these collaboration tools a lot more often uh, than faxing things, I will definitely be happy about that. Yeah. Um, there was definitely a question here, which is, does this meet uh, the LSC requirements for program letter 16-2 electronic signatures? Um, I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know that we've been authorized to use it for citizenship forms and retainer agreements and things. Mm -hmm. So um, that might be a somebody else question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> William, is that something that you're familiar with or can speak to? It is not. That's a that's a very good question. Okay. Um, we're we're using Adobe Sign for the same forms, so the attestations, the citizenship, the retainer, and we're we're building it out. It, it's a good question to ask, but we're we're building it out not only for client-facing forms, but also for internal forms, mm -hmm. uh, for the same reason, because we don't want to walk into an office and put a wet signature on anything anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I am not an expert on on 16-2, um, but I did read it this last week, and um, it does specifically mention um, eSign and the eSign Act of 2000. Um, which DocuSign is designed um, to um, have the basic elements of that, and that is something that we've got here in the uh, signature section, um, but it is not something that I'm an expert in and have reviewed. If there's anybody who's on the line um, who has, please uh, let us know. Um, but I, yeah, it looks like we've got 
um, a few people that say they've been using it um, for years also. Um, cost estimate on DocuSign. Um, so anybody willing to uh, talk about the cost related to this tool? And feel free to type that into the um, uh, questions box as an answer. Um, there is um, a initial um, like $10 uh, version or so, but it's extremely limited in the number of documents. Um, the uh, plans that we looked at uh, ranged from about $20 a piece up to thousands of dollars, depending on whether there was um, API integration or customization. Um, it is definitely one of the more expensive and robust tools um, that is out there. Uh, there is a more basic feature, but it is definitely not the uh, most cost efficient one that we've seen. Um, there's somebody out here who also mentions that for individuals who use legal server, um, that they send attestations um, and retainer agreements through the built-in signature function um, in legal server. Um, and that is one of the interesting things that there are um, most of the modern case management systems will have either a, their own signature function um, or a built-in um, add-on where you can uh, provide integration between those. Uh, it looks like Sue also mentions there's a nonprofit discount um, on TechSoup, um, and you can set up the contract by user um, or by envelopes used, um, but it is expensive and that it works very well. And they've been using it, as mentioned, for about two years now. Laya also has a signature function uh, built into it. So we're going to hit the next um, thing to think about uh, with these program. Um, and this uh, set, sign request had these tips for verifying users. Um, and this is still on the audit and authenticity thing to think about. Uh, but some of the ways that you can do that is add input fields. Um, for the user, and those input fields uh, may be unique to the user. Um, the IP address during signing um, is one way to help verify them, although definitely keep in mind the privacy and security there. Um, there's a difference between having that audit trail that you'll need to prove authenticity um, and what you're submitting to the court. Um, some of them create um, hashed um, or other um, digital locks on there and give you the information. Um, in an encoded way. Uh, other things, um, some of the sign pro signing programs will allow individuals to upload a picture of an ID or something else to verify who it is. Um, once again, you have privacy concerns in redistributing that information, but it gives you a way to prove that it was done. Um, we've seen people use um, phone numbers as a way to verify. Um, that is one of the lower tech and probably easier um, to uh, come by pieces of information. Um, but if you have a, both that it was sent to their email address and that they have some verifying information uh, for some of the rules, that will definitely work on the authenticity. But once again, check with your local courts there. Uh, next thing that is um, well worth mentioning is um, the eSign Act. Um, which is the Electronic Signatures um, in Global National Commerce. Um, it's a US act and it focuses specifically on that these signatures have the intent um, to be just as good as physical signatures. Now this is often modified uh, by your, uh, your local laws or local rules, uh, but this is the standard for um, interstate commerce. It is interesting that it specifically mentions that for e-signatures, you must get um, affirmative consent. This is not something that they're opting out of. It's something that it is very clear to the user um, what you are doing. Um, so make sure that you have that check-in process. Um, the last thing that you want is to add a digital signature later and then have a um, client say, no, I, I didn't review that or I didn't see that or I didn't give affirmative consent um, to it. And then the act also talks about retention um, and keeping an audit trail directly within it. I mean, this is also mentioned inside of that program letter. So um, the, there is 
a significant amount of information out there, but these are the basics from the elect um, for the eSign Act in 2000 um, here. Um, make sure that whatever you're using um, also has a um, is usable on mobile phones, um, especially for clients. Um, um, all of the apps that we're talking about today, and we've got a few more that we're going to talk about, have definitely been um, tested there. Uh, but make sure that it works on mobile phones. It saves a significant amount of time. Some of the older school solutions that people were using uh, did not. There was a question here about being connected to the person using a legal server and uh, signatures through legal server. And I will um, help make that connection happen. But continue to send uh, questions to the question box and we'll continue to respond to them. Got another comment here, which is um, for LSC requirements. Um, I can offer that program letter includes requirements for uh, um, association, authenticity, and intent to sign. The intent to sign requirement for LSC includes providing an option for the signing party that they can reject the um, agreement immediately um, by sending a cancellation email or um, text. This cancellation requirement is more than what we do in paper or wet signatures, um, which is puzzling, uh, but we build all of this into um, their use with legal server, and I'm sending that whole block of text. Thank you so much, Vivian, out to the whole group uh, so they can review that. Excellent. Thank you for talking to uh, directly to that program letter. Standards to look for in kind of the full functional applications, um, some type of encryption on there um, and make sure that it is reasonable and up to date. Um, AES uh, 256 encryption is there. Also, what are the policies of the application that you're using for digital signatures? Um, so, for example, some of them have um, explicitly stated on their website who has access, what is the terms of service, how will employees um, be able to see, is, is there any transfer of your actual data, is your data kept encrypted on their server. That type of stuff is often within their policies. All the ones that we're looking at today, um, we've at least done a quick glance through those. Um, and are um, highly used by the community. There are a lot of little startup apps with very low price points um, that may not even include that whole terms of service or there may be some gaps in it. Um, GDPR uh, has some of the best standards for data protection. It's the general data protection regulation from the EU. Um, and the EU also has its own equivalent of the eSign Act. Um, which is EID.AS. Um, so those are things that you'll see on there. GDPR more focuses on does the user have the right to then access that information or ask for it to be deleted or used. Um, it's something you see less common in some of the US apps, uh, but it is something to consider, especially since California um, has regulations also that are very GDPR-like that went into effect this year. Um, some people have asked about compliance with HIPAA. Um, I know that Adobe Sign in particular um, and DocuSign cover this directly on their websites. Um, I'll, some of the smaller startup um, do not necessarily cover that. Um, and it's something to consider what group of standards you're gonna have for your organization and then what you look at in those applications. Another one that we wanted to mention that um, very important is what kind of document assembly is available. And if anybody is willing to speak to the document assembly that is built into their case management systems that allow for signatures, um, Doc Assemble um, does document assembly and integrated its own um, signature block. Um, it is technically free to use, although you have to have a Doc Assemble server set up, which is open source. Um, it does take a techie to set up, but it does not take a technologist to use and create those forms and to do signatures that way. Um, both um, DocuSign and PandaDoc, uh, which we will cover a little bit later, um, have very strong API integrations and you can get in there and customize 
um, in a lot. Um, there's usually different licensing in order to access some of that stuff. Um, with DocuSign, there is a special tier um, that gives you kind of that developer access also. Oh, there's a very good point here in the comments um, and the questions, which is that um, in their state, they need to be able to uh, witness the signature for their attestation um, or for their declaration, it sounds like. Um, so what they've done is um, do screen sharing via Zoom. So a client will jump on and then they'll see that they're doing that digital signature via that um, screen sharing that's happening. Great idea there. Um, finding ways to um, use technology to get through those local rules uh, requirements is so important. Uh, so a lot of different um, programs out or uh, different options out there. Uh, we're going to go through a few of those. We've talked some already about uh, DocuSign, um, and DocuSign has one of the richest feature sets that's out there. Um, it does go well beyond just basic signatures. Um, you can have contracts and workflows with them. You can do document generation. Uh, they also have the ability to put in analytics so you can see what is getting signed, when, how, those types of trends. Most signature programs do not have analytics or dashboarding options as part of that. Um, has anybody figured out how to witness the signing of a document um, via a smartphone is another question um, that came in. Is there an equivalent hack that someone can present that um, watching via Zoom um, allows? And it can definitely be a challenge um, as most of the video conferencing apps for your phone either have access to your camera um, and may not have access to your screen. Um, I know that the video conferencing private server that we put together based off the 50 tech tips, um, you only had access to someone's camera and not their screen on phone. And being able to share what's on somebody's screen would definitely help. Definitely looking for other suggestions there if anybody can help with this uh, question about um, watching it on smartphones. Um, without having like two smartphones, like someone um, signing it on their smartphone and another one broadcasting what is going on to someone to see it. PandaDoc, um, has anybody here in the audience used it? Um, I know it's been one of the most popular um, for people just starting out. Um, it is one of the leaders in the field and uh, they created the um, unlimited documents and e-signatures as part of their um, donations via um, COVID response. Um, it does have some API options um, that are in, in there. I have not played with them. But if anybody else who has um, experience, please uh, help us with a little more of a review here. Um, I did use it and it was easy to use. Um, oh, there's a, there's a good answer here to our previous question over um, how to uh, see that someone signed it via smartphone. Um, uh, smartphones will have a a uh, video record option on some of the apps that allow you to record movements on your phone or um, even cast that. Um, so you could have them record that and then send it back to you in an email so you see that it's going on. And the questions that people are asking here, um, I definitely also recommend asking to the LSNTAP listserv. Um, LSNTAP.org has a link on the front page so you can become a member of the um, Google group. There's about 700 people from the legal services community that have an interest in tech in some way that are there and can help answer questions. Most of these suggestions came from that listserv. Um, we're down to the last few minutes here, so going to cruise through a few other um, programs that are out there. Um, sign request is extremely easy to use. The features are very stripped down compared to uh, PandaDoc or DocuSign. In our testing, it was the quickest one to go from zero signatures to one signature. Uh, they have a free option, which I believe is 10 signatures per month, which isn't very many. 
um, but they do have very competitive pricing um, for an, for some of the smaller plans. Uh, they are uh, more competitive than some of the other options that we've looked at here. Very, very easy to use. And um, they have a very privacy first uh, perspective. They use a lot of the, the EU privacy values and put those right up front in their marketing and their terms. Um, HelloSign is a another lower cost competitor, um, very easy to use. Uh, it is owned by Dropbox now. Uh, curious to see what kind of integrations we see in the future from them. Uh, one of the things to think about though uh, with HelloSign is the, on the lower cost plans, um, they limit your templates severely. So if you're going to be sending out a significant number of different types of contracts or forms, uh, I believe you're limited to three templates on their lower cost plan. Uh, and which features signature platforms monetize or charge more for is going to be one of the bigger things you think about when choosing one. Oh, sign, sign request specifically mentions a GDPR, um, but not HIPAA. Um, and yeah, not a lot of the program or not a lot of the signature um, groups talk about um, HIPAA and those requirements. Um, DocuSign and I want to say PandaDoc uh, were the two that had specific things there. Um, Adobe Sign. Um, William, is Adobe Sign what you guys are primarily using at this point? We we are two weeks into a 90-day evaluation with Adobe Sign. Um, went with them initially primarily because of the tight integration with 365 and Azure. Uh -huh. um, so it's, it's, we are, we will know more as we roll it out to staff. We've, we're, we're doing some trainings actually today and on Thursday. Um, we've had a couple of, I know the IRS put out a letter, uh, wanted folks to, to sign stuff and, and up for SSI and I think something else. Uh, mm -hmm. So we've got a couple of attorneys we're working with just to quickly spin them up because we've got some deadlines, uh, mm -hmm. but we'll know more in the next couple of weeks and that'll, that'll all get shared via the, via the listserv. Um, has anybody had um, comparison or um, experience with comparing um, Acrobat Pro to Adobe Sign and differences to go for one or the other? I have not actually compared those. Adobe Sign was the only um, Adobe product that I looked at in this. Right, there's definitely, there's another good point from the comments. Um, think about what works short term, um, but also what is kind of your long-term strategic needs. Um, it may be worth moving people over to a platform that has some of the longer term features now, instead of having to learn two different pieces of software. Uh, definitely something to consider is what is the long-term plan versus the short-term kind of emergency need people have. Open it up to any other questions. We're down to actually almost perfectly on time. Um, we've got about three more minutes here. We've got a question here, which um, what has been the easiest for clients with limited tech literacy to use? Um, have there been any issues with clients um, using it um, here at Northwest Justice Project, or, or William, have you run into any um, issues with uh, clients not being able to navigate the software or the options that you send out to them? Well, the the we've done some testing, and and we've most of what we're sending out right now in the form uh, is, is is very straightforward. It's it's got this, the yellow sticky note that says sign here. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's very mobile friendly uh, and, and, and makes a whole lot of sense. The data never actually gets sent. You're emailing a hyperlink, which goes back and the data from a PII perspective never leaves Adobe's infrastructure. Um, we've, we've found it very easy to use um, from a client mm -hmm. perspective. And it's, it's very, very easy from a staff perspective because there's a plug-in for all of the Office products. So there's a Adobe Sign plugin for Word and for and for Excel or for or for Teams for that matter. So whatever platform staff are working in the most, uh, it's it's literally a one-click, drop-and-drag type of situation. 
we are using the templates because mm -hmm. we want a standardized form across the program. And we've the, the basic Adobe Sign evaluation doesn't include the enterprise features that we're probably ultimately going to want, such as single sign on and a document and a template document library to share across staff and those kind of things. But from an ease of use perspective, it's been very easy to consume both on the client side and on the staff side. Um, another question just came in, which um, are the disclosures um, provided to um, for clients to agree to e-signatures e um, available in Spanish and English as well? Um, do people have standard language that they're using for those disclosures um, that they would be willing to share? Two different questions there on kind of the same topic. I will definitely follow up with some with some programs and see if they've got some language that they're willing to share. I know that most of the programs that I've worked with, if, if something is being distributed, it's um, translated for primary languages for the clients there also. But I will see if I can get some stock language to add to the blog post, which should be out in a day or two. Uh, the follow-up question for William, which uh, clarify which programs seem to be easy for clients to use. Um, was was that Adobe Sign that you were talking about directly? Yes, yes. It yeah. It's currently the only e-signature platform we're testing, but we're mm -hmm. probably going to test most of the ones that have been mentioned on this particular webinar um, mm -hmm. because we're, you know, we're looking for the, the biggest bang for the buck. And on the language right. question, I, I did notice on my template interface that you can choose the language. Um, it defaults to English, but I need to I need to click on that drop down and see how many languages are supported on the template function. Definitely worth looking into. Um, I know that there um, I've used DocuSign in the past um, and did not have any problems getting signatures on it. Um, HelloSign, um, I do occasionally run into a problem with the emails being caught by spam, um, although that could be a, a more general issue. It's just something that I've seen recently. Um, in using HelloSign. Um, I think that covers all of our questions at this point. We are about uh, two minutes after. Quick last announcements. Just a reminder that email list, there's a join the email list on lsmtap.org. It's on the front page, scroll down just slightly, and we can get people added. Um, there have been at least three very um, involved discussions over e-signatures in the last month. The archives are available and searchable there. It is a Google group. I, I just, I'm looking at the recipients language options in Adobe Sign and it looks like about 50 different recipient languages are, are supported from simplified, simplified Chinese to Finnish to French to German to Spanish to Vietnamese. It looks, looks pretty long. Excellent. That's definitely another feature worth looking at when you're evaluating. Uh, last thing, just a huge thank you out there um, to our um, speakers today who helped out with this and helped answer questions, um, to Northwest Justice Project and to LSC for um, funding and help making this happen, and then also to all the suggestions uh, that came in through the LSNTAP email list. Um, there are probably nearly 100 comments in the last few weeks and people directly messaging us with reviews and feedback. Uh, we chose the more popular programs from what we've seen people in the community uh, using for the discussion here today. So thank you all so much.